Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Interpreting Slavery at Kentucky's Historic Sites. I'm Sarah Elliott, former director at Liberty Hall Historic Site, but now I'm a curator here at the uh, Kentucky Historical Society. We are very excited about the number of people who decided to come out today. And just for the housekeeping things, if you need the restrooms, they're back in the outside hallway. Uh, water fountains are out there. Uh, soft drink machines are in the hallway behind the Brown Foreman. I would like to ask that you turn your cell phones either off or to vibrate. <clears throat> and if you do need to answer a call, please go out in the hall so that everybody else can hear the speakers. Um, this workshop has been a long time coming, and I do want to thank the Lincoln Bicentennial Commission and the Kentucky Humanitarian for their financial support because we couldn't have done it without them. I'd also like to thank uh, Nash Cox and the Liberty Hall Historic Site staff. Um, <laughs> that's them back there in the corner. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Ann Butler and Kentucky State University, Brooks Howard and the uh, Kentucky State Parks, and the staff of the Kentucky Historical Society for all their help in putting this, uh, this event together. I'd also like to thank Jeannie Potter because this was her idea and it was an idea a long time coming, much needed. So we're very appreciative, Jeannie, for the idea. Um, where are our speakers? I know they're here. Well, we're first up, we have uh, Dr. Blaine Hudson, who is the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Louisville, and um, who is also the director of the Kentucky African American Heritage Commission. Dr. Uh, Ann Butler, who is a professor at Kentucky State University and is the director of the African American Center for Excellence. And then we have uh, Penn Bogart, who is an independent scholar who has done a lot of research on the slave trade in Kentucky and the resistance to slavery. So we're going to, we have a lot to do today. We're gonna to get started. Uh, Dr. Hudson will go first and then, um, then Penn. Thank you all very much for coming. We look forward, your, your mic right there. Well, good morning to all of you, and let me just uh, express my appreciation to those who invited me and also uh, for their willingness to rearrange the schedule a little bit uh, to accommodate my schedule at UofL uh, for the beginning of school and everything. As I told them, my time is not entirely my own anymore. I'd also like to express my appreciation to Ann. She's not here yet, uh, but she has been also very insistent on uh, my being involved in this. As some of you may know, I've spent probably a good part of the past 20 years teaching slavery in Kentucky and in this part of the country. Uh, a lot of my more pu recent published work is concerned fugitive slaves and the Underground Railroad. And of course, when you talk about fugitive slaves, uh, one of the key context setting tasks that you have to perform is to really develop, I think, a good working understanding of slavery itself, uh, particularly to understand why folks might not want to be enslaved anymore. Uh, also to understand some of the, the challenges they had to face trying to get away from it. But what I'd like to do this morning uh, is to explore a couple of the key issues related to presenting and interpreting the slave experience, uh, certainly at historic sites, historic homes, etc and some of the key challenges and problems that historians and preservationists must overcome to do so. Uh, and then if uh, time permits to talk a little bit about some key interpretive uh, issues related to both rural slavery on one hand and urban slavery on the other. Uh, some things that you typically will, will need to think about when you're interpreting uh, these sorts of sites. Uh, and of course, broad general uh, kinds of characteristics, as well as many that would be much more specific, uh, if not idiosyncratic, to the particular sites themselves. Let me start with the issues, though. It's fair to say that presenting and interpreting slavery is not a simple act matter, certainly not in this country. The slave experience is both a window through which we can see the American past clearly and without illusions, and also a mirror in which we can see ourselves reflected 
in the present. When we deal with slavery in public history, we cannot escape the fact that most Americans since the end of the Civil War have not been especially anxious to remember slavery. Many white Americans have family histories that involve slaveholding and feel guilty or feel that others think they should feel guilty about that. Others may simply want to embrace an image of the United States uh, untainted by the history of slavery. Many black Americans may feel that the slave experience is something of which uh, they should feel ashamed or with which they should be uncomfortable. And of course, this creates a variety of different forms of resistance, some subtle, some very overt. Uh, the sons have a way of always sort of working the interpretation of history out of the discussion. There's always a good reason not to do it or not to do it fully and honestly. Uh, some of us may remember some discussions about my old Kentucky home a few years ago and the whole issue of interpreting slavery there or not interpreting slavery there. But for whatever reason, a great many people feel that forgetting slavery is preferable to remembering it. This whole issue of remembering and forgetfulness uh, is a key that we have to deal with, I think, forthrightly, and as the students would say, up front before we move on to other matters. And because unlike South Africa and its truth and reconciliation process that gave that nation an opportunity to make its peace with the past. We've never done that in this country. And as odd as it may seem, 142 years after 13th Amendment was ratified, we're still grappling with that part of the American past. And to that extent, of course, the racial past lives on in the present, both in attitudes, objective conditions, and much of that is translated into kind of the backdrop to much of the work that some of us have done in recent years. Those of us who published understand this very well. There's certain ways of looking at slavery that have a hard time finding publishers in the scholarly press. There are certain approaches to interpreting slavery that have a hard time sort of working their way through in museum and historic home interpretations and so forth. The resistance is subtle, sometimes not, but the resistance is there. So it's critically important to face these issues and recognize that efforts to interpret slavery must overcome many obstacles that are totally unrelated to the validity and the accuracy of the history itself. So if you plan to preserve slave sight, do not be surprised if there is some initial and politically correct interest if not enthusiasm for the project. But also do not be surprised if this interest wanes over time and funds may be more difficult to find or other aspects of the site are termed more important or sometimes in not so subtle terms, there is increasing pressure to dilute or distort the accuracy of the interpretation to make it more palatable to the public or to donors or board or whatever of some sort. The history of slavery is simply not a pretty story. There really is no Walt Disney version. And of course, there are also challenges that are historical challenges. Beyond these ph philosophical and political obstacles, interpreting slavery accurately is ultimately a test or a task and a task for historians and archaeologists and other research specialists in and out of the academic world. Each interpretation must be accurate and authentic. I think that is, is kind of the standard that we all want to set for ourselves and as complete as possible. It's very, very important when we talk about interpreting slavery to try to tell as much of the whole truth as we can. This is one of those areas where it's very easy to tell parts of the truth and pass them off as though they were the whole truth and consequently misrepresent a good bit of the history itself. Uh, create interpretation that the people who live there wouldn't recognize as having anything to do with the place, the time in which they live, but that may serve our interest more in the present than, than the, the interest of historical accuracy. Conclusions and interpretations must be supported by evidence, the most and most credible evidence, again, use of primary sources, etc., <clears throat> where possible, is another standard that we must set for ourselves. 
Most researchers know the key source materials. I mean, obviously, public records of, of many, many different kinds, personal documents, slaves, organizational records, newspapers, other period publications. Uh, I've always advised my students and, and those I work with to spend some time going back to these primary sources because in, in this area, uh, in African American history in general and much of American history in general, there, there's, there's a tremendous body of secondary source material that when you begin to trace it back tends to rest on a very, very shaky foundation in terms of primary sources from long, long ago. Uh, for example, you have this notion about <clears throat> the mildness of slavery in Kentucky that actually goes back to a statement in a book called My Life at Oxmoor, uh, was about one of the bullets written about 100 years ago. And this is purely a statement of how uh, an aging man remembered his childhood on one of Kentucky's largest plantations. There's no empirical basis for it at all. And yet this statement is cited over and over again. The books in which it's cited are cited over and over again until what has no foundation passes for accepted truth. So it's very, very important to go back to some of these original sources and try to get a feel for what was really going on. Maybe it's the same thing that you thought. Uh, one thing I found, and one of the reasons why I've written two books and several articles on fugitive slaves, is that the original interpretation of fugitive slaves in Kentucky was totally wrong. And going back to the actual primary source information made it possible to paint a very, very different picture from what I had been told was true in my public school and can university education. Uh, this tends to be the case more often than not. So I encourage you, if you're involved in this kind of work, spend a little bit of time doing that, that sort of background research and find out if you can test your assumptions uh, or, or not. There are also some other challenges. The nature of American slavery was such that it erased much of the record where African Americans were concerned, certainly much of the record uh, about African Americans as people. Uh, African, -Americans as, Af African Americans as property are all, but one thing I found doing fugitive slave research, for example, uh, is that something as simple as a fugitive slave advertisement may be the only document that exists anywhere in the historical record of that particular African American as a person. That may be it. Everything else, that person's a number in a tax record or a census table or, or, or a slave schedule or whatever. So when you can find documents that were produced by African Americans, these documents are extremely important. It also means being willing to at least work with material that falls in the category of oral history, community legends, etc. Obviously, you want to try to authenticate this material as much as you can, uh, but I've always cautioned folks, don't dismiss it. You know, if something kind of has the ring of truth or it fills in some gaps, you know, maybe you can prove it one day, maybe you can't. Uh, it's usually wise not to dismiss it early. Again, to go back to, to uh, Bullitt's statement about the mildness of slavery in Kentucky, the one thing that's fascinating about that is you know, there's never any shred of evidence of any African American ever saying that. We should tell you something right off the bat. Uh, or my, you know, my, my more recent line of work talking about fugitive slaves and Underground Railroad, folks have created a, a small industry about these quilts. Uh, and yet there's, no, there's yet to be one quilt found or one piece of testimony discovered that linked to any fugitive slave escape. It's a nice idea, maybe someone will connect the dots one day and find the evidence, but again, when you test it against the historical record, there's not a record there to support it yet. Uh, there are a lot of ideas like that that float around, uh, in any case. But don't dismiss legends, oral history, etc., out of hand. Don't dismiss the testimony of African Americans, because what's happened in the historical profession is that certain types of evidence have become privileged. Uh, evidence created through formal means, et cetera, et cetera. And evidence that you would find, for example, in slave narratives, antebellum slave narratives, a postbellum testimony from African Americans, even the WPA narratives, always is subject to the criticism that these folks are biased or little, little old men, little old ladies that don't have good memories anymore, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, what this enables people to do is to dismiss all this tremendous body of evidence from the people who actually experienced slavery and then base the interpretation of slavery on those who never experienced it and sometimes those who have a particular interest 
in not presenting an accurate interpretation. And then you get the Ulrich B. Phillips School of Historical Interpretation of Slavery. Uh, this is obviously what you don't want to see happen. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to understand why this sort of history is popular, uh, but also why it is dangerous nonsense at the same time. Just a couple of things some specifics related to interpretation of rural and, and urban slavery. Uh, some key things to keep in mind, I think, just based on my own research at least. Uh, what we do know broadly can help create some templates that, that can often be very, very important. Remember, in, in the U.S., moderate-sized slaveholdings were, were more the norm than these kind of gone-with-the-wind plantations. Uh, and moderate size, we're talking about fewer than 20 people per, per slave holding. On the other hand, when you get into the dealing with historic homes, people who could afford to build a home that's still around in, in 2007 usually were at the sort of the upper end of the wealth scale, and in many cases, the upper end of the slaveholding scale as well. So even if you're interpreting slavery at a site where you did have a, a fairly large number of people uh, enslaved, uh, that's not necessarily representative of the experience that African Americans had in slavery in general. And sometimes, you know, just with a paragraph here, a picture there, you can, you can show that. Uh, but it's very easy to think that gone with the wind image of slavery uh, is what slavery was like for everybody. Uh, one of the ways in which slavery differs from small to large holdings, for example, is that we think about this, this kind of classic division of labor between the folks that worked in the field and the folks that worked in the house, et cetera. But the division of labor is a bit more complicated than that. There were also people who were skilled artisans and laborers, you know, where do your carpenters and your coopers and all that come from? Uh, but on your smaller slave holdings, the division of labor is not so finely drawn. Uh, people did more than one thing. Uh, just because somebody spent some time working in the house did not mean that that person might not have other skills. Uh, or might not sometimes work in the field. The smaller the slaveholding, a lot of times the slaveholders uh, or their families worked right alongside the folks who were enslaved as well. Uh, and again, you know, you have a number of African Americans when you're interpreting individuals who might have occupied all those different roles. You think about someone like Frederick Douglass, who at one time in his life was put to field work, uh, worked as a domestic laborer, uh, was a skilled artisan because he was trained to be a ship's caulker. Uh, he was enslaved in an urban area because he was in Baltimore for a period of time, then he eventually became a free person of color. So every possible status you could occupy as an African American at that time, he occupied in the course of his life. We tend to think of people being one thing or the other, I guess is my point. And in reality, that was not always the case. Also think about the regional differences uh, in terms of slavery and the kind of you know, agricultural pursuits that people had, uh, climate, et cetera. Uh, think about the different regions. And if you're in dealing with the North, obviously, you know, it's important to remember that slavery existed in the North in many places until the 1820s. Uh, so we're not talking about just a purely southern interpretation. You know, there was slavery in New York and Massachusetts and Pennsylvania as well, you know, well into the 1800s. Now, this may not be something that folks in this room uh, would want to focus on. But remember, you know, there you're dealing with smaller size slave holdings, fair amount of town slavery, uh, people working on farms and, and shipyards, all sorts of different things like that. When you try to portray uh, how folks lived, uh, we've got some pretty decent information from antebellum sources about what slave quarters were like. Of course, in rural slavery, you typically were more likely to have quarters, although sometimes small groups, you know, did not stay separately as much. Uh, but these little places, you know, usually held five to seven people. Uh, you know, recreate what life was like. You got the seven people jammed into a space that, oh, maybe a fraction of the space in the front of this room. Um, and of course, since you can't control who you live with, you know, there were all sorts of interesting tensions just in terms of getting along with the folks that you were forced to occupy that small space with. Um, you know, of course, the whole notion of folks being near but not too near the main house. Uh, private gardens in some parts of the country were common. This is a way to supplement diet and, and reduce the cost of keeping uh, enslaved African Americans from the slaveholders' view. You know, what did this look like? What was life like for the people who lived and labored in these places. Uh, rural slavery involves more isolation, um, in many cases what some would say more brutal discipline, uh, certainly more public discipline on the, on, on the plantations of small farms. 
Um, sometimes access to religious services, sometimes not. Uh, sometimes access to underground schools, sometimes not. But again, the key issue is to you know, try to focus and strive authenticity as much as possible. You know, what was daily life like? Food, clothing, work, child rearing, family, such as it was. You know, what was it like to be enslaved? Let's go back to Federal Hill, my old Kentucky home again. Uh, particularly, what was it like to be enslaved from the perspective of those who were? Not necessarily from the perspective of those who were, you know, who owned the place, but also from the perspective of those who weren't themselves. You know, create a picture that they'd recognize. Urban slavery is a bit different, and Kentucky has, of course, Louisville, Lexington, some smaller towns where you had substantial populations of people who were enslaved. Uh, whites generally were not comfortable with blacks in urban areas, period, period, uh, whether they were enslaved or free. Uh, Frederick Douglass also made a statement years ago about slavery dislikes a dense population. And in urban areas, people had too many what they call small freedoms to, for, for, for folks to be comfortable with. Uh, think about this, you know, smaller slave holdings were more common. Uh, skilled, you know, some folks were skilled laborers. That was a little bit more common. You also had a number of folks who just did brute physical labor in urban areas. Many folks who were hired out. Uh, slave hiring had a dubious kind of legal existence, but it was very, very common as a practice. Uh, so when you talk about people being hired out, think about your hotel, think about your railroads, think about uh, people have worked on, on your rivers and your coastal vessels and so forth, uh, all manner of things. A lot of folks didn't want to buy slave property, but they certainly had no problem with renting it. And, and, and many, many businesses would do this. So how these people lived, could be interesting. It doesn't fit the norm, I guess. Uh, and it's important to bring that out. Many folks who were hired out in urban areas even had permission to make their own living arrangements. And so often lived lives that were not easily distinguishable from the lives of free people of color in, in urban areas. Again, think about these, little, these small freedoms. Uh, in urban areas, of course, you don't have typical slave quarters. You know, people didn't have that much land to deal with. What you do find in many of the southern cities is the, 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 the form, like a compound where you've got uh, houses of relative, like, relatively affluent people with these high walls built all the way around the property and either in the back part of the house or in a separate building toward the back of the property you would have where, where the enslaved folks uh, w would live. Uh, and of course, this translates into the kind of alley culture that, that we see later in the 1800s, where you've got the big houses facing one another across the big boulevards, and the little houses facing one another across the alleys. And, and so in, a, in an odd way, at a time when you think there'd be more segregation than there is today, in a strange way, there was less. Uh, because you had these black and white groups sort of woven together uh, in, in, in the same space, but in very different parts of the same space. Um, it's important to show that. In urban areas, of course, there'd be more frequent interaction with free people of color, because they tended to be more urban, obviously, than rural. People wouldn't sell them land, and they didn't have that much money anyway. Uh, this was something that, that creates an interesting kind of template. There was also more interaction, in general, with whites who were not in the slave-owning family. Uh, this interaction with non-slave-holding whites, for example, uh, and of course, when you get into areas like Louisville, for example, it picked up a large immigrant population uh, from the 1830s, 1840s. A lot of this interaction takes place with the Germans and the Irish and, and sort of at, at the poor end of, of the spectrum. And you have businesses that existed uh, largely because they were engaged in illegal commerce with, with enslaved African Americans, grog shops, pro houses of prostitution, all sorts of ways to and, and buy goods and so forth. But you've got this kind of shadowy zone there. And of course, in this zone, you had race, interracial friendships, interracial sexual relationships, all sorts of things <clears throat> that take place. Now, a lot of this has kind of been washed out of the history. But when you go back and look at the newspapers, just spend some time looking at the old newspapers, you'd be surprised how often you run across references to these kinds of interactions in urban areas. Okay. Uh, also, of course, uh, most churches, this is typically where your free black churches and other churches would take root. 
Uh, enslaved African Americans could often attend if they had written permission from their owners. Uh, Kentucky did not expressly prohibit the education of African Americans, uh, so it's important to realize that while Kentucky didn't encourage it, in some places you do have uh, schools that would sprout up for African Americans, sometimes for short periods of time, sometimes schools that would last for decades. Uh, some schools in white churches and so forth. Uh, some of you may remember that uh, Stonewall Jackson once taught black kids in a Sunday school in Lexington uh, before he went on to become famous as probably the Confederacy's greatest general. Uh, as, well, that's an arguable point, but I'll, I'll just mention that. <laughs> but you never knew who turned up as a teacher in, in some of these. And, and so that's another dimension of what life was like uh, for African Americans in, in urban areas. Uh, much more complex. And, and much more difficult to interpret in many ways, but, but certainly there, and, and certainly very, very important. In both cases, uh, always remember that patrols and surveillance were common. Uh, also in urban, and this is rural and urban, also in urban areas, it was viewed to be bad form, for example, to, to, to physically chastise uh, an enslaved African American on the owner's property. There were too many neighbors around, you know, for somebody to, you know, be, be cutting, you know, lashes on, on someone's back. What often happens in, in these settings is that arrangements would be developed with the jails and the sheriffs where if someone was going to be whipped, you sent, kind of send them down there and have somebody else do it, uh, and then send them back when it was over. It didn't mean that it, there was less brutality or less violence, it was just managed in, in a somewhat different way. Anyway, let me stop there. Uh, last point I want to make, and that is from the standpoint of a historian that's worked with a lot of museums and historic homes, and, and I guess I've been, been chair of the African American Heritage Commission for a long time as well, so we deal with this statewide. One thing I've learned is that it's very, very important to know your patients, to know what you're good at doing and, and what you're not good at doing. I've worked with people who can take the historical work that some of us have done and do things with it when it comes to interpretations, museum exhibits, and so forth that I'd never, I could never even imagine. Uh, we usually get in trouble when we think we can do that as well as the pros in that business can. Uh, so I think you know it, it's a it's an interesting partnership in many cases between archaeologists, historians, and people who really do the work of exhibit and interpretive design. Uh, if everybody in the partnership does their part well, uh, we can do more. Than, than just present a distorted vision of the past. Uh, we're really not in business to entertain. We're in business to inform and to educate. And we do have a responsibility to the truth. Thank you. Since Dr. Hudson has to leave, are there any quick questions for him before he leaves us? Yes. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think one, one, one of them's in the bibliography that they passed out. That's Fugitive Slaves and the Underground Railroad in the Kentucky Borderland. And, and that's the one that's probably most mean to, uh, I think, what, what a lot of folks in the room would be dealing with. The second one is an encyclopedia of the Underground Railroad. Uh, that, that came out last year, and that deals with the whole country. Uh, it's essentially a reference book. I did do some, some new research for it, uh, but that one, if you're looking at something that's it's got kind of a regional uh, focus, uh, that one would be, would be useful. That one also has some fairly extended essays on slave trade, slavery, uh, just some general historical uh, pieces. So I wanted to make it not only a reference book, but a, but a good historical work as well. And these would be available through library? Uh, yeah, UofL Library has them. Uh, McFarland published them, so uh, they should be around down here too. I'm not, I don't know exactly where. Uh, there were also a, number, a series of articles that I did back in the 90s, uh, really with the Filson Historical Quarterly, that looked at evolution of slavery in really Louisville, Jefferson County, that whole region of the state. Uh, I've done some other things on, on slave trade. Uh, and, and 
some of that focus is more Caribbean than anything than, than, than anything else, but you have to deal with slave trade in early studies of slavery here as well. Uh, so, and, and I can give you my card if you want to get in touch with me. I can give you more information on that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, you know, one of the funny things about that is that anybody tries to excuse slavery by, by saying that, well, it was bad here, but it, it wasn't as bad as it was someplace else. Uh, you know, Kentucky slavery w was bad, but it's not as bad as slavery in Mississippi. And, of course, folks in Mississippi, you know, it's bad here, but it's not as bad as it is in Jamaica or someplace like that. And the, the, the basic point is, from, from the standpoint of folks who were enslaved, obviously there were differences by region in terms of climate and what people did and so forth, but the basic institution itself uh, was what it was. Uh, and, and so I don't, I don't think you can get away from, from that. Um, you know, as I mentioned a little while ago, the, the fact that, that we've never really wanted to face up to slavery and, and, and the history of it, to some extent, you know, goes back right to, to emancipation. Because once the country decided that it was not gonna make black people whole, so to speak, after slavery ended, many of the same ways of rationalizing slavery just carried on to the rationalizations for, se for segregation, and of course later on into the rationalizations for inequality that followed the end of segregation. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's interesting that after all this time, Americans really so, know so little about their past and this part of it. Uh, I often tell my students, one of my favorite quotes is from a total non-historian, uh, but some of you may be familiar with Satchel Paige, uh, the great black baseball player. And, and Satchel Paige uh, was asked once, you know, what was his attitude towards et cetera, et cetera. And he, and he said, don't look back. Something might be gaining on you. <laughs> and, and I think that, that's, a, that's a very American attitude uh, toward, toward history. We, we prefer mythology any day. Uh, and yet we can't get past a lot of the, these basic issues unless we deal with them as historical issues. Uh, yeah, so you know, Kentucky, Kentucky slavery comes out when you really look at the documents uh, as being just as, as mean and nasty a form of slavery as slavery anywhere else. Uh, and of course, because Kentucky's border south, uh, slave trade and, 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 and that sort of thing plays a much larger role here in terms of family separation and so forth. Uh, you know, you don't have your big plantation economy, you know, just a, a, fairly, a fairly small number of really big slave holdings here. So, you know, it's organized differently, but, but at its root, uh, it, it's no better, no worse than, than slavery anywhere else. And I think it's important to, to face that and, and stop making excuses for it. Well, I didn't mention Farmington, but I could, yeah. Well, <laughs> Yeah, I know. I work with them too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow, that's a good question. I I've worked Farmington's a historic home, big historic home in in, uh, in in Louisville. For those of you not familiar with it, and that's where the Speed family uh, lived. And of course, that's big now with Lincoln connections and and so forth. Uh, there was a big, big controversy there, what, 10 years or so ago, about the interpretation or non-interpretation of slavery uh, at that site. And, and I did some interpretive work for them, uh, some of which they used and some of which they, they didn't, I think. Um, I think the interpretation is better now. Uh, well, they didn't plantation or farm because mm -hmm. we Yeah, I don't know about Farmington. I don't know where they're over that now. Yeah. Uh, okay, she wanted to know if... She was asking if Farmington was now considered a plantation or a farm. Okay. That was That's the new director at Farmington, Andrea. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, I know. In your local area, what's the best place to start looking for primary documents and what would be the, the best primary documents to start with? Well, you may not necessarily be able to find a lot in that area itself. I mean, if, if, if you can get court records, uh, you need to think about what newspapers might have been published uh, in that area or that, that or included that area in their coverage. Sometimes that kind of information has been removed to state archives. Uh, you know, every now and then, I mean, you can find some, some useful like libraries, you never know. Um, but you probably start with, start with the real simple stuff. Uh, and, and sometimes you'll have a historical society that you can start with and folks who already have done a lot of prowling around uh, that can save you a good bit of time. But again, you know, as time goes by, especially in, in rural areas, you know, many of the, the original documents have been microfilmed and shipped off, you know, someplace else. Uh, but if you can find something that's local, that's great. Okay. Dr. Hudson, thank you. Much appreciate thank you. it. And yes. Thank you. Um, Penn? Well, I want to thank you very much for, I'm going to lean over here and go back, eat the microphone. But I want to thank you very much for um, having me here today, and thanks very much for coming. Um, I'm going to be talking this morning, um, and I'll try to keep this kind of abbreviated more than I was going to, on slave trading and Kentucky communities. And I guess then, then you wonder, well, why the subject of slave trading? And the simple answer is that because slave trading was a part of everyday life in Kentucky in one form or another. And for those people that had money and that were slave owners, in one form or another, they bought and sold enslaved people. Um, there are a number of ways to define or to talk about slaving and what was a slave trader. Um, usually in the popular literature and in a lot of the um, secondary sources that have been written about slave trading, there are a lot of myths, uh, but generally slave traders um, or slave trading is thought of as buying enslaved people, say in Kentucky, and sending them down the river via steamboat or a flatboat to Natchez and New Orleans for sale. It was a lot more complicated, like most things, Oracle was a lot more complicated than that. Um, there was certainly what were called those types of people, domestic or interstate slave traders, but there were a lot of local and regional people that bought and sold people locally and regionally. Um, say, here in uh, Frankfurt that would have bought people and sold them to people in Lexington. There was a lot, probably more of that than there was of the domestic slave trade. There were also um, merchants, what were called in 1840s and 50s commission merchants, which were kind of like a old time version of a modern day department store where people would buy um, and sell all sorts of goods. Uh, they would sell all sorts of goods. Well, almost all of those commission merchants also acted as brokers uh, for enslaved people, taking a commission for sale. Um, so the people that were being sold would remain with the slave owner until that broker or middleman uh, made the connection between a buyer. So you have to also include in this whole topic your very lar your larger commission merchants, which were not only say in Louisville and Lexington, but in all of your towns. Every town, Paris, you know, Bardstown, Maysville, all had commission merchants because everybody was selling goods to you know people locally. Um, you also have to look later, say in the 1850s, at what was sort of the predecessor of a real estate agent, people that called, actually called themselves in those in the 18, we're talking about 1850s, intelligence agents, not like we think of today, but people that had information about where you could buy land, where you could buy houses, where you could buy almost uh, anything of real, what they call real property. They were in, in the intelligence or in the information in the real estate business, those people invariably in their advertisements also advertised that they were also brokers for the buying and selling of enslaved people for, again, for a commission just less in merchants. And as Blaine just talked about, slave hiring is kind of an offshoot of slave trading in that you, you then 
made a whole group of people that maybe were not able to afford buying people. Um, they could rent people. And that fact of slave hiring separated families just as much as slave trading did. And so, you know, I get into that in a talk I'm going to give this afternoon. I don't want to get into a lot of detail, but keep in mind that when you come across hiring, think of what the implications of that word means for the family or for an individual. Um, hiring, somebody could be hired out in the same city, they could be hired out to the next county, they could be hired out to an entirely different region of the state or even out of state. Um, there's more, more often they were hired kind of regionally, but still that's a separation from where they lived and from their friends, from their family. Um, a very similar you know, and not so different situation from being sold, except that there was a term limit on it. But a lot of similarities between slave hiring and slave trading. And also, as Blaine talked about, there are an awful lot of myths about slavery. Um, he talked about um, the main myth that we all, sort of like a bugaboo for all of us, you know, that, are, that deal with history in that slavery is mild in Kentucky. Um, the only thing that was different really, as, as he alluded to, was the weather. And also, you know, here, definitely being mild, or I just got back from a two week, two weeks ago from a research trip, totally off season in Natchez. Um, definitely hot, I mean, as we all know, except I wasn't working physically. But it's definitely milder here in the weather. And some of the agricultural things that had to be done, say as hemp or tobacco, was somewhat milder than the work involved in thing, planting and harvesting cotton and sugar cane. Other than that, whether it was mild or not, was really entirely up to the whim of the slave owner. It had nothing to do with geography. Slavery was slavery. And you really can't put it on a scale of one to 10 as to is it mild? Is it a number two in this state? Is it a number eight in this state? Um, it was also a, sh a dramatic change for anybody being sold to the Deep South, to Louisiana, Mississippi, certainly in terms of climate and possibly in terms of other diseases like yellow fever that were more endemic in the Deep South, say, than up here, and certainly in terms of some of the agricultural labor involved. But when you have 2,500 or so um, advertisements just in Louisville, newspapers alone for slave owners advertising that their slaves have escaped, and that's in a period, like in a 50-year period before the Civil War, those are just the advertisements for people that escaped. Obviously, it's not mild in Kentucky, where you would be trying to escape across the river and try to get to Canada in freedom. So, some of the stereotypes about slave traders, and they go back to the 1850s. I'm just going to very briefly read this quote from an author named Daniel Hundley, who was writing um, about, he wrote a book called Social Relations in the Old South, I think, and it was really like a, it was really a defense of slavery. He was trying to explain how slavery worked. Um, and so he described a slave trader in the 1850s, quote, as a coarse, ill-bred person, provincial in speech and manners, with a cross-looking fizz. I'm not, I think that means like an expression. It's a, or, or nose or something. It's like an expression on his face. Other is a very strange looking fellow. Um, a whiskey tinctured nose, cold, hard looking eyes, and a dirty tobacco stained mouth and shabby dress. Well, you couldn't characterize a slave to anybody as you know, much worse than that. That was, and that stereotype continues really to this day. You know, when you think of, um, and it was buttressed by Harry Beecher Stowe's character, and on and on and on after that. And certainly there were people like that. But as I'll show and try to explain in a moment, that was really the exception. And um, that makes, by characterizing, like, like any other kind of stereotype, by characterizing somebody like that, it puts that person kind of outside society. And it makes that person an object. I'm not, not a victim, a person an object, and not a very real person. And it makes it easy then to kind of shove off onto that person all the ills of slavery instead of examining how that person was a central part of the community and how the community enabled that person to succeed in business. Um, 
an author writing, a Kentucky author named Nathaniel Shaler, writing in the late 1800s, he was writing his memoirs, um, expressed another commonly held about slave traders when he wrote that social ostracism was likely to be visited on anyone who was fairly suspected of buying or selling slaves for profit. The state of opinion was, I believe, very general among the better class of slave owners in Kentucky. Well, you've got a great big qualification there for one thing, because what about the worst class of society in Kentucky? I mean, there, there are all sorts of things wrong with his statement. He truly, he believed it to be true, and many other people echoed that sentiment that slave traders were, you know, they were not only physically repulsive, as, as Daniel Hundley said, but they were also social outcasts. They could never be part of society because of what they did. Again, another stereotype that puts them just as far away from the communities in which they lived and the society of which they were a central part. It's very easy once you do that to say that, oh no, you know, we, I might have sold to that person or, or these, that's the next step in a lot of the old county histories and of the current county histories of Kentucky by saying, well, this person only bought them because sort of he had to and he was sort of a low life person and nobody that was really part of society would have um, joined in that kind of a business. One of the problems in dealing with, um, I guess interpreting slavery and certainly dealing with slave trading in any historic site is that people don't want to talk about it. It's an ugly part of our history. Um, it's makes a lot of people very uncomfortable and it's very difficult to deal with. It's, you know, a slave by identifying someone as a slave trader or as a, or a historic site that had almost anything to do with slave trading puts like a, you know, bad mark possibly in some people's minds on that site. Um, and then by doing that, you ignore really the historic sites um, entire history and you ignore you know, the part that it played not only in something that was an awful part of our history but you also you know, have a history of, of that place that's not completely honest. The reality of slave trading, um, a lot of the reality of slave trading comes out in the slave narratives. Um, very good things to read, um, particularly since we're all, I guess a lot of us, most of us from Kentucky or Indiana, um, read the narratives of Henry Bibb and read the, narrat or the narrative of Henry Bibb. Another narrative that's not as well known by Milton and Lewis Clark, who escaped from Madison County in the 1840s. Both of these narratives were published in the 1840s. Bibb's is by far the most popular of them. But both Henry Bibb and Milton and Lewis Clark emphasized time and time and time again, you know, the everyday threat of being sold not by the slave trader, but by the slave owner. That's one of the few places that you'll find is in the slaves is the responsibility of the slave owner in initiating the decision to sell people. It's not the, usually in the literature, in histories of slavery, especially the older ones, it's the slave trader that comes out to the farm or plantation and he's the one that breaks up the families. Well, not so. You can't do that unless you've got a willing slave owner. And that, if you look at it that way, if you look at it through the eyes of Henry Bibb or the Clarks, and you look at the role, the central role that the slave owner played, then for most historic sites in Kentucky, um, as Bland had mentioned, they tend to be sites associated with people of means. And people of means in Kentucky generally were slave owners. And you take a look there at, and that is one possible connection to slave trading is that slave owner, whoever was the owner at the time, initiating a decision to sell people, whether it's for money, you know, for just because they want more money out of greed, or because settling an estate, which happened at Farmington, um, or, or suspected of, in Farmington's case, suspect, somebody suspected of a criminal act, what they thought was the right person, selling that person, settling an estate, and this type of thing. Um, I guess the point is that it's, it's a lot easier to accept established histories um, than it is to kind of keep an open mind about it. And I would encourage everybody to, whatever the history of your site is, to take a good hard look at who the people were that were the owners, 
um, first owners, subsequent owners, and take take a hard look at who their who the people were that were involved in the operation of the house or the plantation um, or the business, whatever that's whatever that site is. An essential thing to remember is that slave traders were a central part of their community. Um, they were not outcast, and they were, for the most part, um, socially accepted. Just as, as two very brief examples, um, one of the major slave traders um, in Kentucky, and a major meaning long, uh, long, uh, term business from 1805 or 6 all the way up until he died in 1846. Um, a man who, who had a very large plantation outside of Harrodsburg called Fountain Blue, and his name is Robert Boyce. That's all he did was he was a domestic or Indian slave trader. Um, he was accepted in society. Everybody lent him money. And when he needed to borrow money, he had no problem finding people to lend him money. And more importantly, his daughter Eliza married the, do married the son of Judge John Rowan of Federal Hill, uh, Captain William L. Rowan. Uh, does that mean that John Rowan was a slave trader? No. But there is a link, there is a link there more from the Boyce side that shows that certainly from Rowan's, Judge Rowan's standpoint, there wasn't any problem in his son marrying the daughter of a very, very prominent slave trader. That man, Boyce, was certainly accepted in the society, certainly his family was. If he had been the outcast that Hundley and Shaler would have us believe, the marriage probably wouldn't have taken place. A lot of the businesses that were operated, slave traders, were family businesses, and so you've got a lot of kinship links. You have businesses that are operated by fathers and sons or brothers. You have kinship going just like little spider webs all throughout the communities where they were living because they had you know, brothers and sisters that were married a lot of times to locally prominent people. Um, there was a slave trader in Bourbon County named Willoughby Scott, whose wife was the or great grandniece of Governor James Garrett. And you, you just have a lot of connections between traders and society that you really, you can't ignore and that really kind of destroy that stereotype of them as being outsiders. Um, as an example, in Bardstown, where I'm from, uh, the Bardstown Family Gazette in 1857 had a little article about Felix G. Murphy. Uh, Felix G. Murphy owned a very large 500 or so acre plantation outside of town called Maywood, um, whose name lives on now in the name of the subdivision there. Um, his house is no longer standing. But Felix Murphy was a partner in the largest slave trading firm in Kentucky. It was Blackwell, Murphy, and Ferguson. And... Uh, the article says, quote, Maywood, the, the hospitable mansion of F.G. Murphy Esquire, was a brilliant scene of enjoyment on Wednesday night last. The bow and bells of the neighborhood with one or two lovely delegates from adjacent counties were congregated there and with music and dancing and feasting prolonged their parting until, the, until near the streakings of day. Well, you know, if you have, you have Murphy, who later became um, a statement of, from Nelson County, and then later the presiding judge of the county court until his death. Uh, obviously, his plantation was a social center, so he was not an outcast. He also advertised, so it's not like their, their activities are not unknown to the public. These are small areas. Word gets around, who trades, who doesn't. It's, you cannot keep it a secret. So even if people didn't advertise, people knew who the traders were. Another example in Jenny, um, outside of Louisville, there was a slave trader, James Burks. Um, when Jenny Lynn, the famous actress, singer, came to town for one of her performances, he sent a carriage for her. And um, you know, before she left Louisville, brought her out for a performance on his plantation. So you just have an awful lot of very high connections, high society connections between many of these traders and uh, local society. On the other hand, you have what, what is, at least in, in history, probably the most, um, the, the character that people compare most to the character that Daniel Hundley talked about, about sort of these really low life person, were the Arterburn brothers in Louisville. And any book that you read about 
or article about slavery in Kentucky or slave trading is going to mention Tarleton and Jordan Arterburn, and they're just going to be the worst people imaginable. Well, they had to operate in the late 1850s, they had to have a license because the city was going to tax slave traders. License, you had to have a majority of the business owners within 400 feet of your business, and their business was a slave yard, um, write a petition to the city council saying it was okay. And they had no problem getting local businesses to support their petition. Um, the Audubons were good friends with people at their social class level. Um, middle class. Uh, their best friends were owner of a grocery store. One of the best friends was like an obsessive diarist and any day or anything that happened on a day for like 30 years and he's constantly writing about the fishing trips that he took with his good friend Tarleton Audubon. So these folks had no problem existing and having friends, you know, relating to society. Um, there's a really well, very interesting court case which to me is, is very ironic and full of all sorts of mental images of a slave trader outside of Simpsonville named Pierce Griffin in the 1830s. Pierce Griffin would take 40 or 50 men, women, and children on foot and march them west on what's now US 60 or you know the old road to Louisville where they, he would put them on steamboats to take down the Natchez. And in one court case, it comes out that Pierce Griffin is gathering all the men, women, and children together. All the neighbors are coming to see him off. When you contrast that with what you read in Henry Bibb or Milton and Lewis Clark and what they remember of this happening and their harlings of family separation or, or just being witnesses to what was happening, you, you look at it through their eyes and what a horror it is, but then you're looking at it through this testimony in this court case for who was just very objectively and dispassionately describing the neighbors coming and literally waving goodbye to them as they're going down the Shelby or Louisville Road or whatever it is. You get a very different perspective and, is, and really has a lot to do, that has a lot to do with what Blaine had to bat on. It depends on whose eyes you're looking at the history. Um, and just you know, keep, keep that in mind. A lot of the slave traders, their whole object was money. It was all built around money to accumulate money and wealth as quickly as possible. Those that did, and many did, liked to show it off. And then they built these grand houses. I mentioned uh, Fountain Blue outside of Harrodsburg. Um, Spring Station, which is a well-known historic home in Louisville, um, was owned at one time by Burks, the brother of James that I mentioned a minute ago. Um, you know, they bought these fabulous houses. Um, Maywood, no longer there, but I mentioned Maywood. Um, a historic house in Morganfield, the Judge George Houston house, still stands. Um, Judge George Houston started out his career as a slave trader with a physician in Morganfield named Francis C. Brady. And they did that as partners for like two or three years. As Houston said in his own memoirs, and wrote in the 1860s or 70s, after he got his law degree, um, he tried law, he tried to be an attorney for a short time and he didn't make any money. So he decided to go in business with Brady. It was sort of like a short circ shortcut for him to make money quickly so that he could then go back to the law and establish his practice, which is exactly what he did. One thing I find is that slave trading occurred from the earliest part of our history, um, from the time the first settlers white settlers came into Kentucky all the way through 1865, and it was all throughout Kentucky. Um, it was not just concentrated in your large cities, um, like some of the books talk about Louisville, Lexington, Louisville, Lexington. Well, you know, and, and a lot of that information, on the books that I talk about, really go back to J. Winston Coleman's Slavery Times in Kentucky, which out for, you know, in 1940, when we were looking almost 70 years ago, it was a pioneering work. But that is the last book that was written, that has been written on slavery in Kentucky. It was written in 1940. Um, and so not only were his conclusions and assumptions and everything else kind of colored by the time in which he was living, but the sources that were available to him. You know, 
slave trading occurred everywhere. Centers of it were not just Louisville and Lexington. Bardstown was one of the major centers of slave trading from about the time of the Louisiana Purchase up to the Civil War. So was Maysville, Paris. Um, you can list sort of goes on and on. So no matter it, where you are, it, it, where your site, historic site is, um, you know, you're not really ever too far from where slave trading would have, would have occurred. They were very sophisticated businessmen. Since it was all about money, um, they had to have, the slave traders had to have access to large amounts of cash so they could buy people. And the way they got the cash is they didn't have it themselves. What they did is they borrowed it, and they borrowed it from banks. They borrowed it from, in, from what were called private bankers. One of the uh, main private bankers and one of the largest ones in Kentucky was David A. Sayre of Lexington, who bankrolled um, at least a half a dozen slave traders in the bluegrass area in the 1840s and 50s. Um, and we don't find that in, in biographies of Sarah. He was, he, you see that he was a, a well-known and successful private banker and, of course, the founder and, and, uh, of the Sarah School or Sarah Academy. Um, so not only have your banks, public and private, but even more than that, you had wealthy individuals. There was never a lack of somebody that had money um, for a slave trader to, to borrow money from. You know, whether they were farmers or whether they were merchants. Um, I counted about, in my research, uh, somewhere on the order of 100 slave traders that were interstate slave traders only, primarily, from here down to the Deep South in Kentucky between about 1820 and 1860. About 100 people that were separately involved in that. Um, at least 200 people that they borrowed money from over time, sometimes going back to these people time and time again. So there, there was never, it's important to remember that it, it, it was the community where they live that enabled slave trading to prosper and to succeed. It was a legal business. It was a legal activity. It was never illegal to buy and sell people in Kentucky. And so that's coming from you know, tolerating it, perpetuating it. It's coming from the racism that's behind slavery in general that allowed people to look at African Americans as a commodity to be bought and sold. And it was the communities where the people, where the traders lived that made it happen. Um, you could not have slave trading without a slave owner, somebody to a slave trader. You could not have a slave trader buying without borrowing money from a bank or from his neighbor or from a family member or from a wealthy merchant or a businessman or a private banker. You could not have slave trading without a blacksmith to make the shackles and the chains. Um, you were the doctors that examined the enslaved people before they're taken on the boats. So you have an awful lot of people that are involved at one level or another acquiescing in it. You had very, very few people that actively resisted it, white people that actively resisted it. There were some. There weren't, obviously, there were not enough to put a stop to it. You had a number of um, many, many cases where African Americans resisted slave trading um, in terms of escaping, um, in terms of violence or murder of slave traders as they're being taken down the river or overland um, in a group. Um, one of those cases overland occurred in near um, Greenup, in Greenup County. Um, Near Ashland in 1829. Several occurred on the Ohio River. These were very early cases. All these happened in the 1820s. After about 1820 or 1830, um, there were no cases because the traders at that time, you know, exclusively started using steamboats for their travel and get into a whole other whole other area. But I think my time is kind of passed up here. So um, I just want to emphasize again that it was a community enterprise. It was not the enterprise of just a few people. These people that mean leaders were accepted in society generally at whatever level of social class they lived anyway. Um, and they were certainly aided and abetted by many, many levels of, of, of people and institutions in the community that they lived. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I often overhear other ghosts calling Marshall and Parker. Garrett Wallace from Vienna was the only partner that I've ever found listed as, as, as a partner in this county. Would you call Thomas Marshall his partner or simply one of his bankrolls? 
He was both. Um, in a court case in the archives, in the, in the state archives here, there is, in one of the court cases, um, I believe against John W. Anderson, for the familiar with him, he was a slave trader that lived west of Maysville, near Germantown, Kentucky. Um, Marshall, and this is the family related to Judge uh, John Marshall, Justice John Marshall. Thomas Marshall definitely bankrolled him and made, and his, you know, made it possible for him to carry on his business, but he was also a partner because there's a letter in one of those court cases where Anderson is writing from Natchez to Marshall back in Kentucky, giving him specific on the kinds of, telling them about the state of the slave market in Natchez and saying, I need these kinds of people, this kind of gender, you know, is, buy as many people as you can and send them down. And so in that way, certainly he's a partner. For however long that association as partner was, we don't know, but anybody that is, say, if they're, I don't know if, I think Marshall's house is still there, but I mean, if you're talking about Marshall, you would have to talk about him not only in all things that he did in, I think, Washington, Kentucky is where his house is, but, and his family, but also how he aided and abetted the slave trade, and it was, at least for a temporary period of time, a partner with Anderson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. then became a slave trader? No, and, and uh, not in this state. And the reason for that, one of the reasons would be, if for nothing else, would be because free African Americans would not have been allowed to engage in, in business like that, in buying and selling. They could buy and sell real estate, which a lot did. Um, say in Louisville, Washington, Spradling was one of the richest um, and uh, people in the city white or black, and it was a real estate trader, but um, would not have been, that would not have happened in Kentucky. And the reason for that is there would have been too, there just would have been too many roadblocks in the way of that happening. They, they were not, free, uh, free African Americans were not allowed to purchase slaves that were not part of their family. Most of the time when you see in the census records, in the slave censuses, where you have free African Americans as slave owners almost invariably is going to be somebody that's part of their family who hasn't been emancipated. And so they, they buy somebody or they own someone um, and trying to work up and gather as much money as they can quickly so they can emancip emancipate them or certainly make sure that they're not owned by somebody else that will sell them. And if I might jump in here, um, in the case of Monk Estel, uh, Monk was uh, accredited with having at least three to four wives and five different uh, one children. So it's easy to believe that he would have been trying to purchase some of them from slavery, his own children, and that might be in, you know, therein might lie the source of the myth about him being a traitor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Penn, I noticed that the historic marker at the corner of 2nd and Main in Louisville at the location of one of the slave markets mm -hmm. uh, has that last sentence. I think it says uh, uh, the slave traders were out, often outcasts. Yeah. So it's interesting to see if that ever gets changed. Somebody in view will have, 
I'm sorry. In view of the fact that we know that isn't true. We do, and somebody would have to pay for it. Somebody's going to have to come up. With, <laughs> seriously, and I'm not saying that to be funny, but I mean, that's part of the problem. When you have errors yes. like that, you know, somebody made that, whoever made that text came up with a text for the marker and submitted it, was relying on information that was not correct and, mm -hmm. or, you know, or relying on a source and believing, as, as Blaine had said, that it was in a book must be true. And it gets into every aspect of our history. Um, you know, it was oral history, myths, like the gentleman was talking about, and into our historic markers, into our presentations as docents, mm -hmm. into writing about it, into thinking about it. And t like I said, you know, somebody will have to, if they wanted to change that, I guess somebody's going to have to say, you know, this is not correct, we need to change it. And then it gets into some bureaucratic battle about, well, who's going to pay for it? But it needs to be done. And it, and, you know, at least something like that that's a hard and fast physical sign, it ought to be changed. But there are a lot of other things that can be changed that don't cost any money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how we present and how we talk about things that happen. Let the record show that I wasn't offering to pay for that. I was just <laughs> Come on, folks. It's only $1,800 to replace it. <laughs> Dr. Butler, would you like to go ahead? Dr. Butler and Penn will be here the rest of the day, so I'm sure they'll be glad to answer questions, but Dr. Butler, would like to go ahead? Indeed. Good morning. It's uh, really, really gratifying to see the number of you who have uh, taken advantage of the opportunity to come out and dialogue um, about this uh, issue of interpreting slavery in historic sites. I came to Kentucky in 1996, having spent a number of years uh, teaching in the Women's Studies Department at Kansas University. And while there, probably 15 years ago, I uh, began developing a course on um, African American women. I wanted to teach students, let students learn about the history of African American women by reading texts that African American women themselves had written. I felt that it was the closest that I could get to uh, a historical voice. Now, at the time, I was very skeptic of a lot that I had read on gender and slavery. Most of my skepticism came from what I was not able to read because of the uh, slanted versions that had been presented. But during that time, there were two quotes that danced around in my head a lot, and they still do. One of is a quote attributed by, uh, to Napoleon that says, history is a bunch of agreed upon lies. <laughs> <laughs> the other quote is one by Thomas Jefferson, which says, um, honesty is the first chapter in the Book of Wisdom. Honesty is the first chapter in the Book of Wisdom, Thomas Jefferson. Well, I've had to deal with this uh, juxtaposition of the difference in people holding virtues and ideals such as liberty and justice and freedom from all with these practices that negate the holding, the commitment to those particular values. That said, as I wandered into the literature, I came to understand that th it was possible, it is possible to recover the voices of African American women during the slavery, period. I had to suspend all that people had told me about the fact that these women were illiterate, there just is no record left of their voices, blah, blah, blah. What I found 
has kept me more than busy for the past 20 to 25 years. And that is my forays into such things as uh, 19th century newspapers. African American women may not have been journalists during that time, but they sure had a way of showing up in newspapers. They also had a way of showing up in court records. Now, when you hear the term court records being in county courthouses and archives, it doesn't conjure an exciting place at all. As a matter of fact, I'm suffering with my eyes today <laughs> because of being in those places. But you could lock me up in an archive or a county courthouse for a week, and it wouldn't be necessary for me to come up for air. That is because I am aware of many fascinating morsels of information that simply cannot be acquired anywhere. When I came to uh, Kentucky in 1996, right away I developed a very fond uh, fascination with uh, this man to my left. <laughs> and have watched and observed he and Blaine Hudson as they go about retelling uh, the Kentucky African-American experience with slavery. Um, I bump into them in courthouses and in libraries. They were at 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, were all dragging out from having spent hours reading microfilm uh, newspapers. And I am delighted that Blaine's work has come to fruition. I've been waiting for several years to hear, hear Penn's presentation on this subject of uh, Kentucky slave traders because I've bumped into him a lot uh, as he went about the painstaking process of extracting this information from uh, newspapers and court records. So if there's anything that I can say to you today uh, that has great value, it is dismiss the notion that you can't find information because it's there. One has to be willing, however, to go in and go through a painstaking process uh, to uncover it. My topic today was to be uh, gender and slavery. And I decided that I could uh, sum that topic up very quickly. I appreciate the remarks that Bruce Mundy made about the African uh, view of uh, mothers and, and the whole process of uh, becoming of life. Uh, there is a narrative, women's, uh, enslaved women's tiff, the title of which says, far more terrible for women. That experience was far more terrible for women. As I uh, thought back to what would I say today in a few minutes that would help you to understand my concept about women and, and slavery, I just go back to an author by the name of Joanne Braxton and a book that she wrote on black women writing autobiography that was one of the texts that I read about 15 years ago when I was looking for a way to find first person accounts to introduce the whole notion of women in slavery to a class of both young African-American, young white female and male students who were so far removed from uh, any type of historical sensibility that they would often look at me askance, you know. And not just about ancient history, but Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, you know, it was always easy for them to dismiss 
all we know about that stuff, you know, without being willing to deal with any of the complexities. But in reading Joanne Braxton's book, she introduced for me a concept of the enslaved African American woman as being an outraged mother. And I thought, well, you know, that makes more sense to me. It fits more with my understanding of the descendants of enslaved women than the term mammy, than the term auntie, than the term Jezebel, or any of the other uh, stereotypical labels that had been applied to um, African-American enslaved women. And so as I began reading Joanne Braxton and trying to figure out what she meant by this term of uh, outraged mother, uh, she says this, she is the mother of Frederick Douglass traveling 12 miles through the darkness to share a morsel of food with her mulatto son and to reassure him that he is somebody's child. She travels 12 miles back again before the dawn. She sacrifices and improvises for the survival of flesh and spirit and as mother of the race. She is also muse to black muse to black poets, male and female alike. She is known by many names, the most exalted being Mama. Imagine in all her actions and fueling her heroic ones, outrage at the abuse of her people and her person. I find so much evidence in the narratives, the slave, that whole genre of slave narratives, but I also find evidence in these court records that speak to this sense of outrage African-American women were expressing about their condition and which was being suppressed by those in power to tell their stories at a period and a time when they could not speak for themselves. In, um, I'm getting back to Penn in a roundabout way. As I came to Kentucky and started searching for sources, I went down to the Filson Club one day, one Saturday morning. I was in search for information on a group that had uh, operated in the 19th century, certainly following emancipation. And this group of people, this, it was a women's organization entitled Sisters of the Mysterious Ten. I had a couple of little pamphlets about them, but I wanted to know more. Such a curious sounding name, Sisters of the Mysterious Ten. So I went to the uh, Filson Club looking for a host of other things primarily to see what resources they might have on African-American women's history. And as I was going through the card catalog, I noticed this little uh, uh, description of the Sisters of the Mysterian and that a sword, was it? A, sh a sword was held in the Filson Club Museum. So I went up to the person, turned out to be Penn, sitting at the uh, desk and showed him this catalog entry and said, what can I tell you, what can you tell me about this? I'm curious how the uh, Filson Club came to have this, this art. I didn't want to let him know too much about what I was looking for, but at the same time, <laughs> 
you know, I, I wanted to find out what he knew. And he looked at the card and said, well, I don't know. Two to three weeks later, I see in the newspaper this giant article on Farmington, was it? And that uh, Penn Bogart and uh, Bogart and Juanita and several other people were going to be presenting their research, and it turns out that a character named Miss Denny Thompson, the descendant of one of the, I guess she had been a slave herself on the property, and um, <coughs> was going to was the focus of, of some of their research. And she was identified as being a member of this organization known as Sisters of the Mysterious Ten. And there was a, a uniform that she had worn, was going to be on display, her badge and a, a cape or scarf and this sword. So I thought, well, I've got to go down there and find this out. <laughs> And so I went, I got there just when the very last seat in the room was available. So I was sitting on the very back row. And Ken got up and introduced his research and they then talked about uh, what all they had learned about slave life at Farmington. And then I hear him say, well, someone asked him a question. Well, how did you get these artifacts, this sword, which was a beautiful sword? And this fellow says, <clears throat> well, I don't know. Uh, one Saturday morning, a professor at Kentucky State University <laughs> came into the facility and was examining records, and she brought this little card to me and showed it to me, and bam, we had something we didn't even know we had. So um, it has always been a joy to be reminded of, you know, being a discoverer of sorts, but yet uh, very pleased about contributing that one little morsel of knowledge that helped to tell a story. And I think that's what we need to keep looking for, is that one piece of information. Now, Back to court records for a minute. <clears throat> there is a family that I have been studying in Lexington, uh, a free African-American family that I have traced back to their slave uh, lineage to about 1780. Penn has been very helpful for me in that work as well. But one of the things that um, I've run into with that particular story that emphasizes the need to have more than one source of information uh, has to do with the fact that this particular family, there are two women, both of whom I have documented as being free women of color at the time they married. They married men who were enslaved. And there is a record of these marriages. You know, we, we, we hear this notion about slave marriages not being recorded. There is a record of these uh, marriages, and there is also a record showing, a census record showing that in 1830, both of these women are listed as holders of slaves. They were, in fact, family members. And I have found at least one record where one of the women um, emancipated one of the enslaved people. And so there's a whole journey there yet for me to take in order to be able to understand just what, what was going on there. But in another case related to this same study, I ran across a record, a court record. And in the record was the transcription of the depositions that were taken that when I read that deposition, it was like I was sitting in on a conversation. 
It was absolutely phenomenal. The, the voices just came alive. This is connected with Ebel. What was her last name? J Jor uh, Jackson, Ebel Mitchell Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fascinating. I have also investigated to some extent the uh, real life uh, historical experience of Margaret Garner, who was the subject around which Toni Morrison built her novel, Beloved. The records are there. Finally, I want to point out to you one other walking repository who is with us in this room. Her name is none other than Carolyn Miller, the lady who asked the question about John uh, Anderson and Thomas Marshall. Carolyn, as a member of the Mason County Historical Society, has contributed invaluable service to the whole Commonwealth and the nation by her willingness to plow through the Mason County records and uh, excerpt those that deal with African American history and then bind them in such a way that other people coming in can go immediately to that, okay? I will stop now because I know we're running out of time, but I ask you to remember as you go the process of suspending the myths about uh, slavery that you remember far more terrible for women and that by reading these enslaved women's narratives, you almost have to suspend your normal way of reading and learn to listen to the voices as you read the words, because many of these accounts were written, they were dictated to someone else. And so you have to develop uh, a technique of reading almost at two levels, knowing that you're reading something someone else wrote beside the person who's doing the telling of the story. Thank you. And our keynote is here, Larry Earle. And he is currently the Artistic Manager of African American Initiatives for Colonial Williamsburg, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, excuse me. Uh, before assuming this role, he served as Manager of Planning and Administration for the Foundation's Historic Area Division. Prior to returning to Colonial Williamsburg in 2002, Mr. Earle served as the Director of Education and Public Programs at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in Detroit, Michigan. Larry has also served as a consultant for George Washington's Mount Vernon, the Estate and Gardens, the New York Historical Society, the National Park Service, and the National Portrait Gallery. His latest work is an enhanced music CD entitled Ear to Ear, The Passage of African Music Through, Afri Through American Slavery. He has contributed to several works on film, including Jefferson's Monticello, Liberty, the 2005 documentary, Slavery in the Making of America, and the 2006 Emmy Award-winning educational broadcast, No Master Over Me. Let's welcome Larry Earle. Good morning. Come on, this is such a large and robust group. Surely you can do better than that. Let's try that again. Good morning to everyone. Um, I am delighted to be here with you all this morning for this wonderful occasion. I sincerely appreciate the invitation to come here to speak before you. And I just want to say thank you to you know, the folks who really sort of helped to plan this in Liberty Excite, Kentucky uh, State University and Kentucky Department of Parks. I really appreciate the opportunity to come here with this group to talk about interpreting slavery at historic sites. Um, we're going to try to get back on schedule. It's a good thing about having a keynote speaker who doesn't really write his things out unless he's really, really has something that uh, he wants to remember to say when he just makes notes like this. <laughs> it means hit these points because you, you, you know exactly, you feel that comfortable with the subject. So I'm going to try to get us back on schedule, which is great. Right? 
uh, but at the same time, hopefully give you some great um, salient aspects about this journey that I've been on uh, interpreting slavery that you might find helpful um, in your quest. Now, if anyone has ever seen me speak before, they will know that it will be quite difficult to keep me behind this podium. I um, am um, an interpreter or museum educator um, by trade. I, I, I started in the museum profession at the very bottom as, as, as some tours around and have slowly you know, done several different things in my museum career. But I'm, I'm proud because I'm sort of the um, inheritor of, of a legacy. I'm, as uh, some would say, I'm probably a fourth generation African American museum professional. And what that essentially means is that roughly for a little over about 50 or so years, African Americans have been professionally engaged in the vocation of the museum profession. So it's, it's a legacy that I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to have inherited and to, to say that I am a museum the only business that I know, um, but it's an enjoyable business that I, that I haven't been engaged in. I want to tell you a very quick story, if I may. Um, and this story um, is about an African king. Um, his name was Mansa Musa. Uh, perhaps many of you might have heard of, of Mansa Musa. Anybody ever heard of Mansa Musa before? Mansa Musa was a very, very wonderful African king. The story takes a little bit of embellishment. Um, but he um, was a Muslim, and he took the Hajj, or the pilgrimage, to Mecca. And he took many of the kingdom, and they stopped off in Egypt for a little while before they crossed over into um, the Arabian Peninsula and said when he left Egypt, he had taken so much gold that every peasant in Egypt had gold and that they came over with almost uh, 10,000 people upon horseback and camel. So it was, it was a great, great line. But Mansa Musa was considered to be a very wise king. So this is a story that talks about Mansa Musa's wisdom um, and I hope you can catch the meaning of it. Um, but since we're a very important African king, I want everyone to say his name. So everybody can everybody say Musa for me. Can you say Musa? Musa. Okay, I'm going to say this again. He's a very, very important king. Uh, he's a very, very respected and, 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 and marvelously researched king. So when you say Musa, you don't say Musa. <laughs> you say it very robustly. You say Musa. Can you say Musa? Musa. Very good. Musa was a great and wise king. Is there a wireless mic? Is that mic on? Because that will aid me in people hearing me. Things I just, I'm, I, it's hard for me to stay behind the podium. Um, thank you so much. But Musa was a great and wise king. And Musa was great and wise and all the people of his kingdom loved him. And whenever Musa came out before the people of his kingdom, uh, he would just simply wave his hand like this, and the people would say, King Musa, we love you, King Musa. He'd just wave his hand, and all the people would say, King Musa, we love you. I mean, they just, just erupt in this great, you're going to catch on in a minute. Um, whenever King Musa came out before his people, he would win, and they would all say, <laughs> King Musa came out before the people of his kingdom one day, and he stood before them in all his regal majestic, and he waved his hand, and they all said, <laughs> He said, people of my kingdom, I, your King Musa, would like to challenge anyone here to a debate. But not a debate in words, a debate of silence. And anyone who shall defeat me in this debate of silence shall have land far as your eyes can see. All the gold that you wish to carry and all the cattle that one wishes to possess. When King Musa said this, Everyone knew how wise and how great that he was. And surely if he could win a debate of words, he, they knew he could win a debate in silence. So no one wanted to debate with King Musa. So King Musa went on to say, he says, any of you here who will challenge me in a debate, again, not of words, but a debate of silence, shall have land for as far as you can see and your mother's eyes can see. And if your mother don't have any cataracts, that's a long way, right? <laughs> Good eyes. You should have all the land you wish to possess and all the cattle you wish to own for not only you, but your entire family. And when King Musa said this, one woman in the back of the crowd began to jump up and down. She said, oh, pick me, King Musa, pick me, pick me, pick me. He said, see, that woman doesn't know anything about debating in silence. <laughs> but no one else raised their hand but this woman. She got louder. She said, pick me, King Musa, pick me. I will debate with you. Pick me, pick me. And he looked around, hoping that some some man of substance, 
perhaps of courage, <laughs> might raise their hand to debate with King Musa. But none of them did. So King Musa had no choice but to go and get the woman who was jumping up and down saying, pick me, King Musa, pick me, I will debate with you. So he said, you, woman, come, we shall debate. Let's go. Me up now. <laughs> Stand right here. Right there. Turn and face them. All right, very good. Well, she's very animated. But <laughs> well, there you go. King Musa said to his people, he said, people of my kingdom, this woman chooses to debate with your great King Musa in a debate not of words, but a debate of silence. I shall defeat her in this debate, and I shall come back and tell of our exchange. So King Musa and the woman went to a place where they could debate in silence and not be seen. King Musa faced the woman. The woman, she turned and faced King Musa. The first thing King Musa did is he held up two fingers like this. And the woman looked at him like she was crazy, right? <laughs> like he's, but then she held up one finger like this. She shook it out. She shook it back. She took it high. She brought it low. He's, <sighs> Round one of the debate was over. <laughs> King Musa then took his hand like this. He waved it around like this. He said, the woman. She clenched both of her fists very tightly. She shook him at King Musa like this. She shook him high. She shook him low. She did a right cross. Ooh. <laughs> this is the state of Cassius Clay, ain't it? <laughs> Round two of the debate was over. King Musa then turned and reached in his pocket. He pulled out something. He showed it to the woman. He put it in his mouth. He chewed it up, and he said, Poof! And again, she looked at him like he was crazy. Right? <laughs> but the woman, she turned. She reached in her pocket. She pulled something out, and she showed it to King Musa. King Musa said, ah, oh, you have won, woman. Go, the debate is over. Leave. You won, won OK? <laughs> and the debate was over. King Musa came back before the people of his kingdom, and he stood before them in all his regalia, and he waved his hand, and they all said, <laughs> He said, people of my kingdom, I must tell you that as your great King Musa, I lost the debate with that woman. I didn't actually want to debate with her, but she was jumping up and screaming so loud, pick me, King Musa, pick me. I had no choice but to debate with her. But I will tell you what I proclaimed to her in this debate. At first, I said to her, I said, woman, do you understand that as a king that I am like a god? And because I am like a god, there are two gods in the entire world. Me, King Musa, and the god up above. Two gods. She says to me, no, King Musa, you are not a god. There's only one god. That god is high, and you, sir, are not it. Well, then I explained this woman. I said, I am such a powerful king that I could actually just smite your entire family. I could destroy them and, 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 and wipe them off the face of this earth. She said, oh, no, King Musa, you will never do that to me, my family, or my people, because we are strong. And whatever you do, we will fight, and we will fight you. So then I said, well, perhaps then I won't destroy you. Perhaps what I will do as the king of this kingdom is I will shoot you out, disperse you to the farthest reaches of the world. This place that you call home will no longer be your home. You'll forget your name. You'll forget your music, your religion, your style of dress. All those things you will forget, and you will be a people without a place, without a past, without a heritage. She said, no, King Musa, that will never happen to me, my family, my people, because we will always tell our stories. When people don't want to hear our stories, we'll tell our stories. We'll sing our songs. We'll speak our language. And before they know it, they'll know who we are because who we are will be a part of them. So that is what happened in the debate. I'm sorry, but I lost. 
Meanwhile, the woman was in the back of the room telling her side of the debate that happened. I want you all to hear it. Please stand up, please. She said, people of the kingdom. People of the kingdom. She did not want to debate with King Musa. I did not want to debate with King Musa. She said, I was sitting right here. I was sitting right here. Minding my own business. <laughs> minding my own business. And he picked me. And he picked me. And then. And then. He tried to poke me in my eyes. <laughs> he tried to poke me in my eyes. She said, but I was quick. But I was quick. And I, I blocked him with one finger. <laughs> I did. <laughs> she said, and then. He tried to. Uh, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> he tried to do what? <laughs> what did he try to do? He tried to smack me. She said, but I clenched my fist. And I tried to strike him back. You're a bad man, but <laughs> I am. <laughs> she said, and then. He showed me something disgusting from his pocket. <laughs> and it was nasty sunflower seeds. It was. <laughs> disgusting. You should have thrown them away. She said, do I look like a bird to you? <laughs> No, I don't. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> she said, I showed King Musa. I showed King Musa that I didn't want his sunflower seeds. That I, his sunflower seeds. That I had, that I had my, own lunch today. my own lunch today. And it is, and it is a hard, a hard boiled, boiled egg. egg. Give a big round of applause. Well, my friends, the moral to the story is very simple, right? There are always two sides to every story. Let's talk, if we may, about just that. Um, when we look back at the African-American legacy, we often find that historically we have told, been told that the history of this legacy which a defining point in that legacy was the institution of slavery, was one that was vague and one that barely existed. But for those of us who truly understand Americans, the African imprint is distinctly buried within our DNA. That we as Americans who distinctly understand that our identity, which we hold to be uniquely American, has an important African presence. It is a presence that can be identified and was shaped through the institution of slavery. It is a, it is a unique characteristic that we hold that was sort of formed in the club of Jim Crow segregation. It, it, is a, it is an impression of who we are that was sort of bred and developed by the fire of the civil rights movement. And sometimes we have to be reminded because that impression of who we are, that unique Americanness that we possess, we sometimes don't see the slavery, the African, the struggle. Things we hold dear, for example, in America, it's uniquely American to have a sense of individuality, to wear what you want to have. If you want to put 10 nose rings in your nose, you can do it in America to dress in the way that you seem fitting. My tie is rather orange. Orange is a very important tie to me. Some of my colleagues might say it's a little bit too ostentatious. But I like it, so I wear it. Besides, my wife bought it. I better wear it. <coughs> Nevertheless, this uniqueness, this identity to be an individual, where does it come from in American society? How does it originate? I mean, let's just take a simple aspect and discover what it means to us. Well, if you go back to the time when America was being formed during the 18th century, and you look at the portrait, you look at many of the documents, you find that everybody is dressed pretty much alike, particularly in Virginia, where I come from. Nothing too bright. Nothing too out of place. But then you just take a leap over to the runaways where Negro Tom has ran away, and he is seen in the sundry of clothes that Negro wears. However, Tom has dyed his Osnaberg linen breeches brown. And he has a straw hat, which he has cut out the top and put a chicken's foot on it. He wears a cock to the side just a bit. And we get a picture of Tom that shares not only his identity, we find Negro Tom as enslaved, his brown pants, 
his hat cocked to the side, was for him a way of expressing his individuality. Though he might have been enslaved, that was his way of saying, I am Tom. Tom has flavor, style. That sense of trying to find that uniqueness. There's a wonderful author and, and historian and researcher by the name of Shane who teaches down in Australia who's wrote a fantastic book called Styling, um, which talks about African-American expressive culture and deals particularly with uh, a survey of clothing and how clothing was an expression for those enslaved Africans to show their uniqueness. And this expression, this, this way of expressing freedom, sort of makes its way into our American identity very easily to detect. But we, we don't oftentimes understand that. So that story may be missed when we say, well, who? Well, we look at another example, that our language that we speak, and, and I do a lot of work with, with students. I love students. I actually have a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old. I'm on the home stretch. <laughs> you say, no, I'm not, huh? <laughs> That's what people keep telling me, you know? <laughs> Nevertheless, it's very interesting because, you know, my kids, they speak in what people call slang. They say things like, yo, what's up? Now, I know none of you here use any language like that, right? Anybody ever say for anybody ever say yo what's up? Well, the great thing about saying yo what's up is that in actuality, you you just not really speaking slang. You're speaking an African language, a derivative of an African language. Because you see, in northern Nigeria, there's a language that is spoken that is called Hausa. And in Hausa, when you greet someone, you say to them Sanu. Can you say Sanu? And when someone says to you Sanu, your reply to them in Hausa is yo wa. Can you say yo wa? Well, those house are put upon brought, boats, brought here to bathe, they don't come empty-headed. They may, in many times, come empty-handed, but their language, their culture, their understanding of the world arrives with them. And so they have to speak English, and they learn it, so a little bit of their house mixes up with you know, English, and it makes its way through town, time, and yo is sort of shortened up, and you get yo. Well, perhaps there are those of you who said, well, I've, I've never said yo, and I never will say yo. <laughs> cool, hey, because again, as my grandmother would say, you can't escape Africa. At some point, she will always reach back and snatch you when you least expect it. For example, how many of you have ever said to someone, okay? You ever said okay? Well, interestingly enough, many Africans who were brought here to be enslaved were um, Mindy which is another African ethnic group. And in Mindy, when you understand something that someone says, it's all right with you, you use these words here. You say, okey dokey. O-K-E-D-O-K-E-E. -E -E. It's a Mindy word. Okey dokey. I understand. I got it. So you shorten up okey dokey, and what do you get? Okay. I could just imagine. I could imagine the uh, overseer or perhaps the foreman saying, you, you, you do that. You, are, you do that, you outlandish Negro. You got it? Okie dokie. <laughs> because you see, when we, for those of us who are in, engaged in the business of telling this history, we understand that as many of our speakers told you that often survives, that we often hold up in laurels of the history of the very wealthy. But for most people, this association, close contact between blacks and whites has occurred for many, many years. So it seems only natural that our styles, our taste for southern foods and southern cooking styles, which were developed by enslaved women, our, our unique American expressions, our language finds in its way many of those African identities. So, and under that, makes it imperative that we, as Americans, do all we can to fully interpret our past. Because you see, if those characteristics, if those unique sensibilities are part of who we are, then it is our responsibility as museum professionals, historians, public historians, docents, museum educators, curators, exhibit designers, to tell this story in its fullest. Because you see, we have to identify that it is our story. Well, surely it is a uniquely African-American story, a uniquely existence. Slavery was something that, that African-Americans identify with, that as the gentleman said earlier, is, 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 is embedded within their DNA code, their experience. 
but it's also in all of us. Not even if your hue is as dark as mine. But then again, you know, don't shake that family tree too hard because you never know what might fall out, right? <laughs> I say that in all seriousness because, you see, to get the idea of interpreting slavery at historic sites, we first have to understand what does it have to do with me. And it has a lot to do with you. But even more so, I oftentimes think that we as museum educators and museum professionals take lightly our responsibility. Perhaps some of you may be, but I'm not in the business of preserving history for history's sake. I don't find any great fascination or use for that. It's wonderful to see a Van Chippendale piece or Rococo or some slipwear. That's great. It's a lovely style. But why preserve it if it has no meaning of our past and provides us with insight on our future or interpreting our contemporary world? Museums shouldn't be cautious of relevancies where we hold up these fine principles of the past in a light of commemoration and of exaltation. Those should be the places where they're engaging their communities. And understanding how the past relates directly to who and what day. So this brings us back to slavery. Slavery, as we all the time hear, is a sensitive topic. Slavery is a topic where people are uncomfortable. Well, why are we uncomfortable with slavery? Well, let's think about it. We're only 50 years removed from separate drinking fountains. A little over 50, I should say. Depending on where you were, it might, might be closer on the side where they decided they were going to go through it with it or not. But that's, that's a very recent history. It's an extremely recent history. And while we like to laud ourselves for great strides, we have to be true to the numerical equation. We had history for over 100. Uh, the history of slavery existed in this nation for over 150 years. We had another 100 years of legal Jim Crow segregation. And discrimination and du, and du jour. And then it doesn't matter, it wasn't a southern phenomenon or northern phenomenon, it was an American phenomenon. And we have only yet 50 and some odd years arrived outside of that equation. Now, family is a very unique family. I come from a family of physicians, engineers, mathematicians. They, they have PhDs in mathematics and how anyone does original study in math, I don't know. Two plus two is always four to me. But I didn't pick up on that gene. I don't have the great you know, ability to wrestle with equations, nor do I have the patience. But I have a love of history. And I have a basic understanding of math. And my basic understanding of math is that you can undo 300 years of history totally and wipe it away in 50. So back to the issue of slavery. Our work as museum educators is serious. There's a great line in a movie called The American President with Michael Douglas. When he's being bombarded about his beliefs as a president, and he finally at the end of the movie gets the courage to say to his opponent what he should have said a long time ago. And one of the sticks with me, he said that being an America, American is serious business. Democracy is serious because if you really want to uphold democracy and speak to a country that says it's the land of the free and the home of the brave, then you have to be prepared to say this was a land that held slavery sacred into its heart. But this was also the land that within the framing of its constitution was able to make provisions that it could come out of that. So when we go back to our framing documents, and we understand that in order to form a more perfect union is a journey, not a destination. We are always on that journey of how we form a more perfect union. And the stories that create the past that lead us to this perfect union, this journey, include slavery. And your role in that is a very, very serious role. Your role in that is a very, very important role. Because you see, you, when people come to our great shrines that tell about our past and about our history, and you are there at the front line giving that information, you could be the dumbest bunny in the world. You couldn't have, I mean, 
you, you, you don't, don't even have to have read the docent manual. Fell asleep in all the training. But when you stand before that group, they look to you as an authority. And what you say out of your mouth and many times is gospel. Far greater power. I oftentimes tell my colleagues, um, because I started as an interpreter, I said the, 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 there's some interesting things about interpreters or you know, frontline educators. Is first of all, we talk too much. It's the first thing we do. We interpret talk entirely too much. I can say that. I fancy myself as one. Don't take offense. I'm a part of the club. But we talk into, and why do we talk so much? Because we have this wonderful, vast wealth of knowledge that has just been pumped into us that we have a passion for, that we want to get out. But we talk too much. We do. And we oftentimes don't realize the power that we have. Oh, our museum administrators, they understand how powerful we are. They're always having secret meetings I in and getting them involved. Because you see, if you determine that you're going to tell a lie, then perhaps an infinite amount of people will learn that lie. If you determine that slavery is not an important issue in our past, no matter how many seminars they send you to, no matter how many trainings, if you decide that it's not important, then how many people a day we understand that it wasn't important to our past. So I really do mean it. It's a very, very serious and a very important position to be in. But what I think is so great is that we have to understand that interpreting slavery is something that we may never get right. It's something that we may wrestle with, you know, because although we learn things and we have this education, we still bring our, our own natural sensibilities into the equation. We still watch the 6 o'clock news, and we are bombarded with images of African Americans a certain way. We've been trained in the, the vocations of, uh, of perhaps a historical framework that says, well, there's just not a lot of information about African Americans. That has been indoctrinated in us. We have, we have, we've upheld that. We've heard that slavery is painful and people don't come to historic sites to feel pain. They come to be happy. We've, we've been indoctrinated with that. But what we have to understand is that history ain't pretty, is it? But history is a marvelous, marvelous, marvelous narrative. The American narrative of pain is a great saga of journey, of, of discomfort, of struggle, of triumph, of people blending ideas, people blending cultures to form a unique American identity. And sometimes we leave some people out of that equation, but we try to have those within that framework who are constantly speaking, let's go back and reach, let's find, let's bring us all forward. It's serious, so we have to always be about the business of striving to do better. We have to always understand how this narrative, this story, is crucial to the very fiber of who we are, things that relate personally to me. When we understand that, it makes it a little easier to go out here and tell a story that may be a difficult story. It makes it a little easier that when we make a mistake or we don't do something quite right that we can try to work at it. Because I believe in the Tilden model. I believe that interpretation, that history should be provocative. If it provokes you to go pick up a new book, right on. If it provokes you to go out and join a civic action group and be engaged beyond the basic level of voting in American democracy, right on. If it engages you to enter into the museum field and take upon this quest of telling our history for yourself, right on. If it provokes you to tears, right on. If it provokes you to celebratory uh, uh, enthusiasm, right on. All of those things are the emotions that we should try to bring out. 
Because if, we've, if we relate to people not only at a cerebral level, but at an emotional level, then it makes it a lot easier for me to say, hey, look at you, you old beautiful African. You take it a little bit more because you see that African-American experience is you. That language, those food ways, those identity markers, they make it a lot easier. So I encourage you this day and tomorrow to cast off your preconceived notions. <coughs> I encourage you to look not with a jaundiced eye, but with a clear vision of what can be. Change is not easy. But the great thing of change is that sometimes when you allow it to flap in the breeze and re be refreshed and nude, it has an effect upon all people, even those cranky ones who didn't want to come along. But it's something that you can do. You can do it whether you're a little old white lady who just is a part-time dosing on the side. You can do it if you're African-American who's just trying to find their genealogy and get back to their own history. You can do it if you're a student fresh out of college with all the enthusiasm of plying into wonderful archives. You can do it. Why? Because I said so. <laughs> But most importantly, you can do it because it's your history. You all have been a delightful audience. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to engage them. But I'm looking forward to today, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow, and I'm looking forward to talking and meeting each and every one of you. Thank you so much.